Welcome, Regen Ag Nation. This is Rand Pod 4. I'm your host, Roger McKinley, and I am joined today by Trey Reed and our guest speaker, Ryan Hansen. Hey, thanks for having us, Roger. Appreciate it. I'll kick it over to Ryan real quick to introduce himself. Yeah, thank you. Um, like Roger said, Ryan Hansen worked for a company by the name of ATP Nutrition. Um, ATP is based up in uh, Winnipeg, outside of Winnipeg, Oak Bluff. Thanks for getting on the show here, Ryan and Trey. Uh, why don't you jump into how you got involved with ATP, a quick, you know, 20,000 foot view of the last 10 years and really where the company is at today, Ryan. Yeah, you bet. Uh, I started working for ATP in 2018. I was working uh, in egg retail space, utilizing their products with my uh, producers and just saw something that they had, they had something going. It's a, a space uh, that they specialize in, in terms of looking at nutrition, the world of biostimulants, um, analytics, um, what type of technologies to enhance that use of nutrition and in, in looking at biostimulants that I just had not seen from anyone else in the industry. ATP takes a very proactive uh, approach on how they look at managing a crop, managing the acre. We're not a standalone program, but we're additional to to figure out how to challenge the status quo, but there's got to be a different method, or how can you tweak a method to uh, look at maximizing that genetic potential of what that crop has. That's great. You know, coming off our, our last episode, we really focused on, you know, technology, data, and innovation and what's coming out in 2024. And, you know, we're stoked to have you on here because you have a ton of awesome stuff that we've already discussed, but really getting our viewers involved. And I, I want to start with that first that first piece of technology. What is this new technology that you guys have? And why why is it so exciting for us to be looking at this coming into this next year? Yeah, good question. How much time we got? Uh, no. all, all day. We got all day on here. <laughs> yeah, so the ATP has got the access to a tool, trade name of NutriScan. It's a handheld unit, uh, remote sensing, spectroscopy, near-infrared uh, technology that you're able to utilize to, if you collect a soil sample, you're able to analyze it, have results back in a matter of minutes. It's evolving into a space of uh, green tissue. Fingers crossed, spring, summer 2024, that's when that launch of that program to be able to utilize uh, a handheld unit where you can go out into the field, take a soil sample, take old leaves off a plant, new leaves off the plant, see what that plant is experiencing in the root uh, zone, what that plant's doing nutritionally, being able to reallocate nutrition, what's deficient in those immobile nutrients and get results, make a same day application all within, oh, hours. Yeah. So this is really cool to me, Ryan, as an agronomist, because I really feel like it helps you do your job better. And that's, what's exciting about it. I think for farmers too, the ability to manage things in season, because a farming season will throw tons of stuff at you as you're going along. So to be able to, we, we utilize sap samples as well. So to be able to analyze those leaves and, and see what's going on right now, instead of getting them back three days later, to be able to pair that with the soil data of what's going on in the soil. And look at that. It's, it's all very exciting. So I think the question that everybody has is how accurate is this information? <laughs> you just went right to it. At least you, you, you skipped over cost. You, <laughs> <laughs> that's usually everyone's first question. Uh, it's, it's accurate. It's just got it. You got to, it is a different extraction method of the information. One way I try to describe this is some wet labs might use a different extraction method to isolate certain micronutrient information. If it's a DDPA extraction, HCL extraction, utilizing near infrared, we can't match our results up to every one specific lab. But what we do is we have to get correlated. So we got to take our numbers and put them in perspective. So we spend a lot of time uh, in that department. So our goal is even if the numbers at first might not relate, it's going to correlate, if that makes any sense. That does make sense. And it also brings up another question because um, you say you spend a lot of time trying to correlate that information, but it also comes down to from a scientific and a mathematic uh, point of view, 
I mean, how many samples are we trying to pair that up against? How how tight is this data, and really, how much confidence can we have in it? Good question. We should probably bring in an expert. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, so from from my from my level, from what I've been able to experience with uh, producers, with customers, with a NutriScan unit, it is it is a tool that it takes practice to get used to new uh, tension levels and parameters, but being able to make a sound recommendation and be able to work off of that information to make an agronomic uh, plan, it, it's it's right there. Awesome. And and there and I, I jumped around it, but there's plenty of data. It's probably easier to see if I show you ch- charts and show you R squared and linear lines and how things go, but yeah, there's plenty of information out there. So just to kind of recap on this, we're talking infrared, which has been around for a long time, and you guys literally have an algorithm that is looking at soil structure to give you all the data that we would see off a standard soil sample that we've been utilizing for the last 20 years. So it's a different spectrum than the, so you're close. But uh, so near infrared and, yeah, 93 different parameters that get crunched together to make that elder algorithm. A company by the name of Acre Cares uh, backs it. ATP just has the license to be able to sell that technology in North America. That's huge. I, I see the benefit Trey really stepping on these farms is th- the economics behind this. I mean, you're having instantaneous data at your fingertips from an agronomy standpoint of making a recommendation. I mean, you're talking reentry times on fields when farmers are spraying herbicides, insecticides, uh, fumigation. But more importantly, you know, in crops like hops, where you have a very tight time window of 30 days where that stuff's hitting the wire, where you need to be making recommendations. And if you have samples coming back to you in a matter of minutes versus days, that is massive. Oh, it's huge. Um, when you're trying to solve problems, which is kind of what we're, we're out there doing, I mean, we've got a basis for all these crop systems. And that's where that foundation works really well. But now you experience a problem that you got to figure out, well, time is money, right? We got to get this thing turned around just as quick as we can. Um, If you're trying to utilize, say, foliar fertilizer and you say, well, I know what it takes to put this into the crop. I know ultimately what this crop needs over a season to get that done. Well, what's it got in it right now? And I think that's the huge uh, question that everybody has is, can I optimize each field to get the most out of every field? Because we all have fields that are on the bottom side of yield, other ones that bring the average up. But ultimately, I think it's that process of trying to get better and better and better every year. That's a great lead into the the three pillars that you guys have at ATP, Ryan. Why don't you dive into that nutrition aspect as Trey is kind of talking on foliars with Tell our listeners a little bit about the the other pillars that you guys have at ATP and how that folds into what Trey was just talking about. Yeah, you bet. And this is where the NutriScan is integral <laughs> into uh, these the, the nutrition, the biosyn, especially nutrition, because Trey was already hitting on it. And when you go and make that recommendation, sometimes you might get that response from a producer. Well, why? So. For us, instead of leading with, here's this product, you need to use it, well, why? Like, the, the product is the what. Um, so for us, it, to back up again, it, it's just a matter of how do we build that understanding of this is why this might be being recommended by ourselves, and then it leads into, okay, what type of nutrition is in this product? So then you can kind of break that down. But nutrition for us, it's it's really important. You can talk about four R's, right placement, all that stuff. But it's are we? This is nutrition in the soil. Is this nutrition in, through the leaf? Is this uh, a, what type of uh, product is it? Chloride, an acetate, a, um, an oxide, um, EDTA. Is it chelate? So um, that is a core part of our business. It's just explaining and educating, understanding forms of nutrition, and we very rarely deal with nutrition in isolation. We've done a lot of research to show biostimulants enhance. There's a nutrient use efficiency. There's a, an enhancement of being able to uptake nutrition, acquire nutrition. Biostimulants, in my opinion, do not replace the need for nutrition. And that's why we use those in tandem a lot. Yeah, that's a really interesting thought there. And that, again, goes into innovation. I mean, I can remember... 12 years ago when I started in this business and 
I think that category of products were referred to at the time as snake oil, <laughs> something like that, right? Um, and, and we all laugh about it, but I think it really what it comes down to is making promises that lack the data to support the recommendation that you're making. And we've talked already on this podcast a lot about it. We, t we talk about it from a day-to-day -day basis, but we want all this to be built off, to, off of data rather than somebody out selling you something. Let the data dictate your decision-making. And I think that's one area that we've seen in talking to you guys and getting comfortable with your company is you guys have invested a tremendous amount in data and trying to discover and find those answers. So why don't you talk a little bit about some of the things that you guys have done from a data standpoint and how you've kind of put your money where your mouth is? Oh, you bet. Um, it, it ties back into just being able to explain why. What's in the jug? So what's a snake oil? It's something in a jug that I don't know what it is and I don't know what to expect and I don't know really why I'm using it. And, and that's what, and then what's the easiest way to describe it is snake oil. So we have spent, or ATP has, they go through extensive amount of effort and to work with uh, key industry members from universities from around the world. I mean, you mentioned uh, names like uh, Dr. Patrick Brown at UC Davis, Dr. Ishmael Chakmak, University of Spantia in uh, Turkey. So yeah, it, it's, there's a, we can go local, we can go around the world, ATP, if there's a, a leading expert we try to uh, utilize their expertise to oh, explain, oh, provide insight of how our technology works. And you guys have a phenomenal back end on your website of educating as well. It's not only just the product sources and why we need to be utilizing this, but you're also educating farmers, growers, anybody in the industry of why we're doing what we're doing. Yeah, one of the key things is just it, we're about growing the pie. Uh, one of the things our president establishes is don't fight over the slice, grow the pie. There, there, it's such a small part of the world of agriculture that it, we don't need to be dickering, bickering over just what is already being used or acres already being touched. And so to grow that pie, our ask, thing that we, ATP, does a lot of that research education, we do things what we call a nutrient summit, uh, ATP Academy, we bring in key experts within the industry of seaweeds, organic matter, substances. You get into the amino acids, flavonoids, polyphenols. I mean, you, you get into different substances, we'll bring in those people that if we don't feel like we're experts in it, we'll go access those people. I know you just touched on one of the things right here that we have on our list that we're going to hit today, but um, humix, fulvix, that's, that's one topic we've talked about. And new versus old, why don't you tell our listeners a little bit about one of the products that you have that is very different that we feel like is going to be a huge impact in the regenerative agriculture space this year. One of the world of uh, one of the families of biostimulants, arguably there's five. Think of them like a, like a herbicide family. One of those families is like organic matter substance, and in that organic matter substance family, you would have humix, fulvix, and one of another substance or another group within there would be the dissolvable organic matter family or the soluble. And what really distinguishes those groups is where they're sourced from. Humix, fulvix come from um, oh, the parent material that's the linenite ore, that layer right above coal, really millions of euros old carbon sources that there's nothing wrong with these sources. They're just utilized differently. You would ma you, you'd manage these technologies differently. The convey uh, molecule, um, dissolve organic matter molecule, it comes from relatively young, hundreds, th young thousands of years old type of uh, a source. And you don't have to make those, mol those compounds soluble. They're already in solution. So it makes there's a handling aspect, but then there is a composition difference. Oh, the hydrocarbons. So being right above coal, what do you think litter night ore probably has quite a bit? Why well, use humic that carbon well, you're trying to help with that biology you got that carbon high carbon fraction people try to use humic you throw them through a sprayer oh man you start plugging up stuff you know like what is it, what's that coming from it's from those carbon long chain stuff and so then they had to figure out how to utilize get a similar product but you got to make it a little bit uh, easier to handle and that's when you get the fulvix and so you got to clean up that product a little bit try to be able to handle it differently so and when you refine a humic from fulvic you get 
higher oxygen containing compounds. You isolate that, you get a little bit more plant activity, and you can get those fulvics into that foliar space versus the, you might see those humics more positioned obviously for that in, in the soil aspect. And Convey is highly, highly oxygenated uh, product. And that is the calling card. So it is something that's highly plant active, highly plant responsive. No, that's great. And one of the things that we advocate a lot for in this regenerative space is diversity in terms of our microbial groups. Or, you know, even when we go to make an application, we want to put different actives into the situation. So this idea of a young carbon coming into the space and sort of challenging or, or changing the game a little bit, let's go into that a little bit more. So I think kind of where people have settled on this deal is they'll use humic acids in the soil a little bit more. They'll use fulvic acids and small chain um, into their foliar fertilizers or, you know, maybe prote with protection products or something like that. So where does young carbon fit in? How does it behave? What does it do best? What's it yeah. good at? As, as close to the plant as possible. Because again, it's a carbon source. So obviously bugs are going to like it. So one stewardship around that is obviously if you have something close to a seed, close to a root, onto the leaf, it's going to be a better spot than just a random spray across stubble. Because that's still going to be sought after by bugs to say, hey, there's something here I might be able to take advantage of. So you got, then that affects use rate, all that stuff. But yeah, again, it's what it's comprised of. So how it can stand alone is really what it's made of. And the number of compounds, that number of compounds uh, are oxygen based. So you get into these tannin families, that makes this compound way more plant active. So if you're looking, I don't, you can argue rates, let's say a foliar rate of a uh, fulvic acid, let's say a quart. If you're looking at a quart of a fulvic acid to compare that to a rate, a full rate to get that similar effect from a dissolve, a convey or dissolve organic matter, we're looking at oh, four ounces, just because of why, or just because of how that that compound is made up and of those oxygen containing uh, compounds. So that's that's where these families differentiate themselves. So is it fair to say maybe this is a little bit like fertilizers in a way in their journey to where, you know, we started out just putting these basic fertilizers on with zero technology and then we would just put hundreds of pounds on and get the response that we got. And now we've gotten to where we're using a lot of technology and fertilizers that are making them way more efficient and optimizing them so we can utilize a lot less. Is it fair to say that this is kind of the evolution of humic substances? Oh, for sure. And even just the world of biostimulants. You know, biostimulants, something that aids in nutrient use efficiency, nutrient uptake, uh, helping that uh, plant, a substance that helps with abiotic stress, mother nature, um, and it can help with biotic, sometimes living stresses as well. Just the compounds within just the whole group of biostimulants definitely leads to that for sure. You know, one thing I love that you said on this is this is a new age humic and compared to our other humics that we're utilizing out there millions of years old we got to dig that up we got to spend a ton of fossil fuel mining that so maybe you can kind of give a little insight to everybody out there of of saying you know what is the footprint like out there from a sustainability standpoint versus you know millions of years versus hundreds of years oh good question first uh, i definitely want to say there's definitely a right space for humic acid. I'm not a uh, not anti I'm not anti uh, humix. There's definitely a right way to manage and utilize that. And I, I would personally <laughs> utilize it. It's just I'm just trying to educate a new carbon fan or new carbon product. But I would say the expert on how this is all done, but knowing how in terms of litternite ore being mined, being that that type of process versus all organic matters are literally just being pumped out of a river in northern tier uh, uh, Canada or Europe, and literally bulk of the water goes right back into that water source, and you, then you're just transporting this carbon product into a different area to then concentrate it again, which is just filter. 
that's huge. I, I see that huge from a carbon a carbon intensity score standpoint. You know, impact on the environment. That is one of the things that when we're looking at utilizing products in our mixes on these farms is really you know how are we impacting the environment. How can we find something that is more sustainable, or we don't have to spend as much energy mining or refining this before we get that impact into into our farming practices. I guess the next question I have that you kind of alluded to is that nutrition aspect. And we started to talk about stress. Talk to us about, you know, calcium and boron and one of the products that you guys utilize and how important that is in product mixes that we're utilizing on farms. You specifically brought up calcium boron. Uh, calcium boron are, are really primarily considered for most of its life or in with plant um, a structure element. You got calcium, think of it as sheathing on your wall. You got a boron, think of it as a two by six in your stud, or as two by six stud in the wall. A plant, those are very immobile elements within a plant. We've been actually, be, so some of that research time back, like stuff that was done with Dr. Patrick Brown, we can actually show that there is actually boron, you can actually create movement or you ha can have some uh, flow and mobility uh, with a boron application that's paired with a substance like uh, like convey, and th again, that is why these two are leveraged together. The thing you got to watch out for, and a lot of times you get asked, why don't buy a stimulants or why doesn't a product work all the time? And it, it is just mother nature um, has a lot of curveballs, and, and that's where we take our best stab. And again, ties back to the NutriScan. That's where we're looking at technologies to help understand what that plant is actually facing. So it's not just that feeling of a stab in the dark. Let's find a technology that can actually tell us what's going on to make a more educated application there. Yeah, I think that's a good thought. Something that comes to mind there is it's almost like certain product classes we hold to a higher standard than others. And the way I'll bring this up is you could plant one hybrid, one corn hybrid in one year and have a certain yield and have a wildly different yield or experience out of it the very next or following year. The other thing that happens is fertilizer. You could use the same fertilizer products, packages, rates, and get a wildly different result in one year or one field or whatever. So I think that's it. I mean, you want repeatability, you want consistency, you want to make sure that you're dealing with products in a company that have a high rate of consistency with, with performance, but it's not, nothing is going to work every time. Is that fair to say? Well, for sure. And it's like, what metric are you measuring? So like uh, weed control. I mean, I think most people think you got a pretty good control of a weed if you hit 80%. I don't know what the, what the big companies use in terms of that, but so something that's 80% effective on growing bigger roots, growing more vegetative mass, higher yield, better quality. So there's different ways to, to measure, uh, but always, you're always brought back to well, what was that yield effect? How, how much yield did you make or how much yield did you preserve with whatever practice you did? Sure. So that brings up an interesting fact, and we're kind of talking yield. So let's go back to the beginning where it all starts, right? Because I think we've got that seed. We had this conversation where there's way more potential in a seed than what we deliver at the end, which is a yield. But one of the funny things here is we talk a lot about the – crops that we grow in the nutritional density and things like that. But what about the seed? Is it fair to characterize and say that if we raise crops now that don't have the same nutritional value that they did 50 years ago, are we raising seed that doesn't start off with the proper nutrition? And, and how do we look at that process? You kind of answered your own question, <laughs> but yeah, you nailed it. So yeah, the, the seed density, uh, seed nutri nutritional qualities, definitely have an effect on how that plant starts off its life to then reproduce again. Our president of our company has done a lot of work to show the nutritional quality of a seed has, can have an effect on yield potential. One element in particular, uh, just to start the, you know, to start off, zinc. Your zinc concentration on a cereal, let's say wheat, we know it should be as close to 40 parts per million, even better 45 parts per million. When that zinc concentration drops, that zinc fuels that oxen pump. Oxen is a, a plant hormone that tells that seed to wake up, start germinating, start growing stuff. And when it's low in that zinc, just think you're low gas in, in the truck. You just can't go as far. 
and that's what uh, zinc is that gas for that oxygen process formation. Again, to answer why, why does uh, oh, some of our on-seed stuff have zinc in it? It's uh, we want to make sure if we don't know the zinc concentration in the seed, we're gonna we're gonna cross that, still check that box off, make sure it's good. Yeah, that's great. And then you know the other part of that too is we we go through these soil samples and we try to apply everything beforehand that might be needed. But oftentimes it's cool, it's wet, it's doesn't have the right you know, the right conditions really for um, getting getting something available right by that seed piece. So talk to me a little bit about how important you think it is to utilize either nutrition or biostimulants on the actual seed piece itself. It is my favorite place. It is my favorite spot. I hate missing step one. Uh, like for me, when I look at a year, you look at the, what are those guaranteed passes? You know you're going to put something in the ground what's something I can I do at that moment to maximize that genetic potential or just start that crop off to a good good start? I I think about it as like, uh, oh, in football, big old linemen, before they even start moving all their weight, they got to have a little small position step usually. That's what on seed for me. It is a little position step to get you going in the right direction. But if you get it right, you can really set that plant up for, uh, I've seen some really cool responses of just starting there in furrow on a seed piece or on seed. That's huge. So also let's talk about the economics of it, because I really see that as a position of something where you can apply a very small amount and, and a very small cost and also get a great benefit. So talk about the economics of that versus like say a broadcast application or even an in furrow treatment. It's balancing efficiency and maximizing that whatever you, typically what you're using, maximizing that product's uh, capabilities. And you, typically on seed, on seed is you're addressing what's going on in that seed kernel. You are not addressing what's going on in the soil. I do run into that quite a bit saying, hey, we've got this heavy loaded zinc product. If you use enough on seed, this is also going to do something for your soil. That That's, in my mind, that's a that's a hard, that was a hard for me to connect. And in terms of economic, it's actually, it, in terms of if someone's new to the space, they're trying some nutritional biostimulant, all this, on seed is a pretty, uh, is a pretty cheap place to start for uh, a producer to look at it in, in terms of typical per acre cost. If it's something new to them, and they just want to try something. It's one of those first things I usually say like, hey, in other words, don't know where to start, try something on seed if it's logistically possible. Because you can find something from under a dollar to maybe two fifty, two hundred fifty cents per sixty pounds of something, and you've got there's some really quality products out there that you can find in a a very economical uh, price point. We love that, and actually that kind of backtracks into what we talked about in previous episodes. It's like we got to look at the context of all these different farms. Not everybody's raising almonds with a very high output. Not everybody's raising onions or, you know, vegetable crops or leafy greens or, you know, even corn or whatever. I mean, for goodness sakes, you can speak to this, but we got dry land growers growing wheat like you just discussed that we're getting 40, 50 bushels out of that crop if we're lucky. So, you know, to go across and spend 40, 50 bucks is just not an option. Oh, no, no. And, and, and for me, my home base is central Montana. Dryland egg production is, that's the, the key, that's the primary acre. And what's the number one thing that I still promote and for that management acre is start on seed. That is the, I would, that is my favorite place to still start for managing that crop. I don't care if we're growing 20 bushel, 25 bushel spring wheat or 40 bushel winter wheat. This really comes back into the yield limiting factors and the stressors that uh, we witness in agriculture. So I, I think one of the things that we want to touch on next is, you know, what does that seed have from a potential, like what Trey was talking about, where were we at 50 years ago and where are we at now? How important is that nutrition in the seed and the nutrition we apply to that seed? Well, I mean, shoot, and genetics have come a long way in that story. There's a guy, uh, Dr. Frank Salisbury, uh, at the University of Utah. NASA came to him and said, hey, 
in this seven meter squared area, what can you crank out in terms of production for a, a spring wheat? And in a seven meter squared area, you extrapolate that into a per acre basis. And I mean, he got to manipulate the gas, the, I mean, the whole environment around these plants, but seed off the street, 1300 bushel. So, I mean, what's the world record out there? Two, 270, 250, 270. World record soybeans just got broke here last year. And you got a, what, uh, a 500 bushel corn. So if you think about if it's 1300 bushel, this guy was able to get out of seed off the street and then we're still world record guys are still pulling 270. And then you go to county averages. I mean, Fergus County, where I'm at, I mean, you're looking at a 40, maybe 37 to 41 bushel winter wheat <laughs> type of number. You think about the, the subtraction game that that yield or that plant is going through once it hits the, goes in the dirt. That's where it's, when you utilize products, it is not, here's what I'm adding and maybe this is a marketing ploy or pitch, but you got, in my mind, I, I have a couple of years back, you had to start thinking it is a subtraction game and it's a preservation game. Once that seed goes in the ground, you're managing that crop to minimize as much loss and trying to maybe, hey, maybe utilizing uh, nutrition differently or biostimulants or whatever the product, can I change my rate of loss to end up more than what I have been? Yeah, Mother Nature, right? That's, oh, that's yeah. the biggest factor that you got thrown in that mix. Oh, for sure. Mother Nature. And you get this, you know, we, we talked about like Wallace's Law. Um, so it's managing how do you look at multiple yield limiting aspects at a time and trying to take a proactive approach, not look at certain things in isolation. What's a, and you guys, I feel like, do a really good job at that, that holistic, trying to look at the big picture and attack something, and not in isolation. Yeah, and let's talk about that for a second. Let's get into nutrition in terms of maybe some of the interactions. I don't want to get too far off in the weeds here because that could probably be its own <laughs> podcast in and of itself. But one of the things that we try to share with growers or people in the industry is oftentimes adding too much rather than we're usually looking at deficiencies, I guess, right? <laughs> so adding too much of something can, you know, limit something else. I mean, it's really a conversation about antagonism. So Let's talk about it from two standpoints. Let's talk about antagonisms of nutrients in the plant yeah. and antagonisms of nutrients in the soil. So in general, uh, Mulder's chart, too much of one thing, can how, how can it affect another thing? In the, in the soil, I mean, one, like one key relationship, you got cal copper, nitrogen. Too much nitrogen can mess with copper. Uh, you get you, you'll hear a lot of uh, potassium, magnesium. You'll hear a lot about phosphorus, zinc. You you start then pulling these back and say, okay, if I put on too much phosphorus and I'm affecting zinc, well, how does that happen? So you'll see some of that. There's work out there. High phos can also inhibit uh, that plant's ability, or, or not inhibit or limit or might limit or might delay certain timings of that plant wanting to make mycorrhizal relationships uh, within that soil profile because. If the plant has got a lot of phosphorus right there, and it's there, it's like the path of least, least resistance. That plant isn't going to spend a, doesn't need to whole, spend a lot of energy to go say, I'm going to go give some of my sugar up to these bugs to go get me phos that could also maybe go get me uh, some zinc. But you look at wheat, 50% of wheat uptake of zinc on average comes from mycorrhizae. So that's where you get, well, how much phos is too much that I'm going to put on too much? I'm going to inhibit that mycorrhizal because I still want to make that plant go get some zinc. Let's talk about interactions of nutrients in the plant, though. I mean, it's pretty well documented that you've got too much push from one nutrient. It'll cause pull of another. So, I mean, how, how do we balance all of that? And what's the best way to, to I guess, address that if if I might, you know, let's say I go out and do a scan or a tissue test or a sap test and, and I've got too much or too little of one, what's the best way you've seen to address those issues? We're about to find out when NutriScan gets launched. <laughs> because when you have that real-time analytics and you go, it, there's going to be a little bit of a learning curve. I, I think that is a new space of agriculture because you don't really, there really hasn't been that immediate information of here's the result. Mm, within minutes you could be making that application what's the effect 
you can do that in the greenhouse. You can do that in growth rooms. You can, it's a, there's different environments to be able to do that. Um, that's what I think is really exciting. It's going to be huge impacting, you know, a watering event, for example. I mean, we can write recommendations all day long, but if you don't have the right watering schedule, you're extremely dry, and then you have a watering event before and after, you can see a huge translocation of nutrients. Oh, for sure. And you look at certain nutrients, that, you know, you got that osmosis, diffusion, you know, root interception, those certain nutrients that then all of a sudden get exposed, that all that's from the soil, that all comes into to play as well. That pushes us into a really cool topic, which is one of the foundations for what we like to try to do. And that is to drive the biggest, baddest root systems in the business. We're always after that because we feel like if we do a good job of making good roots, um, we reduce potential for pathogen problems. We increase uptake of nutrients and water and all the things that plants need. So we're constantly after two things, one, to increase root systems, and two, to optimize how the plant performs. And so let's talk about the rooting part of it. What have you seen in terms of biostimulants or crop nutrition that is the most important concepts to get right to have the biggest, baddest roots on the planet? Uh, make a big mop. You want to you get that mop underneath that plant, go after that water, go after that nutrition. That's right in uh, ATP's wheelhouse. I mean, a lot of our research, we have a little scanner. Uh, I, I, I generalize it, but it's a wind riser scan. It's a water bath. We are also after that. We don't, you can put nitrogen on, you can create leafy tops or whatever, but you also need the, the structure underneath to support that above ground growth. You need that storage vessel for carbohydrate. Like that root system is huge for a multiple factors. And that is a metric that we screen new biostimulants, rates of biostimulants when we're trying to hone in on what is the correct application uh, or rate for a product. And I mean, it goes back to how do you first start building that root system, you need the zinc, you need that oxygen pump going. So, I mean, zinc comes in early. You got manganese and early seed nutrition. You got to split that water molecule. Manganese is huge in there. Or in terms of photosynthesis, when that uh, first leaf pops up, boron nutrition. When you got boron, it is that early root growth. If you're deficient in boron, that root growth is going to be inhibited. Root boron concentration right around that root cap is really high. Um, and so, if you're low there, you don't usually see it up top you're going to see it below ground and that root growth is pretty much going to stall out. You can influence rooting oh, oh, tremendously with biostimulants. You got the seaweed family, the plant extract family. You got the organic matter substances come from. You got kind of like the polyamines, uh, amino acids. Uh, th there's ways that you can uh, stimulate rooting uh, from there. And you have the primary rooting architecture and you got that secondary. What I'm actually after is I want as many bottle brushes. I, I want to see those root hairs. Uh, that those are those scavenge, Those are the parts of those roots that I want to, as many tiny of the secondary that m oh minor root system to go into those crevices and go sop up everything they can go get. We've done a lot of cool research there to show just how biostimulants can aid in nutrient uptake. But again, back to previous, that only can carry a plant so far. You still need to feed it. Yeah, and a lot of the research that we've looked at, too, is it's an environment for the type of biology that you want to attract because the first defense for a plant is the biology that surrounds the root systems, right? And also, that's the give and take, and that's the exchange of how they get a lot of the nutrients later on as well. Is that correct? Oh, for sure. And you think about boron being that structure element that we talked about that is that two-by-six uh, stud in the wall. And so if you've, you're trying to build a wall and you all of a sudden you start skipping some of those two by sixes, you're not going to have a very structurally sound wall. And that's no different for a plant. And we've been able to show that it's actually really cool that that plant will actually start leaking sugars, that it can't control what's coming in and out of that root system as efficiently if it was adequate in, in its nutrition, and specifically boron and zinc. And then with sugar being excreted, I mean you can attract good things, you can attract bad things. It's really cool to hear you talk about some of those miners and how they fit into the equation because all I ever hear about anybody talk about in terms of nutrition and roots is phosphorus. There's been some, there's actually really cool research out there. Like even in low phosphorus soils, you can actually end up, you can generate a bigger root system because that plant is all of a sudden, in typically those plants, you'll see a smaller vegetative growth because where's that plant having to 
allocate resources. It's having to put them down into the root, build that root system, and go acquire it. But what it's going to have to sacrifice, it's going to have to give something. You can still have a really good root system in low FOSS soils, but that plant, when you look at that, and there's some really cool pictures, that plant's exuding a lot of organic acids. There's a lot of acid that plant is exuding out of that root system, which that organic acid's coming from that sugar component that that plant's making from photosynthesis, and that's also then taking away that sugar where it could be going somewhere else. Yeah, and that comes back to balance, right? I mean, it comes back to trying to hit that middle ground to really produce the best below ground and best above ground response that we possibly can. So let's get into the second part of that. If you don't mind, let's talk about how to optimize plant performance. And really, we just we just think of it in terms of how do we help the plant do what it's trying to do better? And that is photosynthesis. What can we do from a nutritional standpoint to optimize photosynthesis? Think about all 18 essential nutrients. (laughs) Because, I mean, in that process, all nutrients are utilized except pretty much uh, calcium boron. So it's it's not all of them can be managed, but if you're at least thinking about it, you're able to help that plant uh, harvest sunlight. And we go back to that uh, Dr. Frank Salisbury out of Utah. What was the number one takeaway? Maximize the solar panel of the plant. How are you able to help that plant harvest that sunlight energy? And so when you think about photosynthesis, it requires every single essential nutrient. This wasn't on the agenda, but this brings up a topic that I'm sort of interested in hearing your comments on. But everybody talks about all the things that we can buy and put on a plant. But part of the 18 essential elements is oxygen, hydrogen, and carbon. So... What can we do as producers for those three elements, and especially because of their importance? I mean, I I saw some data where it talked about we need 100 times as much carbon in a plant as we do nitrogen. So we don't even think about it. Is there a way to optimize that or influence a plant to uptake those three elements? Well, for sure. And I think a lot of it, well, water. <laughs> Mother Nature, we need the water aspect. We need that plant bill to take up H2O. And there's stuff, stuff coming from there. Then we're going to s- smash it together, make, uh, oh, we got water and carbon dioxide, and we're going to smash it together and make sugar. So that that's where the primary CHO is going to be coming from. And I think it ties back to what uh, Dr. Salisbury is saying. How can you increase that uh, efficiency of that plant doing that harvesting of sunlight? So convey that dissolved organic matter we've been able to show in research that that plant actually helps increase the chlorophyll density so if you have a more dense chlorophyll content within that leaf blade where are you going to be able to harvest more and more efficiently sunlight and so plants really aren't that efficient at uh at the whole process and harvard had a study of showing that numbers and it's taken a long time for oh plants to improve on that so there's aspects of what we can do nutritionally and that pair it with that biostimulant to help that plant and you'll hear talk about that in the active carbon pathway liquid carbon pathway that is that process of it's not organic matter production it's not that breakdown of material to get to carbon it's that process of building taking building blocks and building up to carbon and that is coming from that plant utilizing sunlight energy exuding those compounds into the root system or into the out of the oh the root system into that rhizosphere into that soil profile and being able to build uh carbon content as well awesome yeah that's really cool and i think also that falls in with something that we're always trying to do in the optimization process i mean i tell people one of the things that you can do that doesn't cost you anything other than time is make sure you manage your water properly Part of that aspect is the way that plants get nutrients is, you know, in that water stream, but also that's how they get oxygen and hydrogen a lot of times, right? So I know it sounds really simple, but let's manage the water properly and let's make sure that we have manganese, right? So that we can break those atoms apart and separate them in the photosynthesis process. Let's make sure that we can you know, get as much carbon into the plant and that we can 
hype up that factory so the plant can use more of it instead of feeding so much down in the soil. Well, even when you think about boron in relation to water, boron movement into a plant primarily comes from transpiration. So if you're dealing with a heat, a stressful day environment, that plant might be getting a little stress. It might st- close up those stomata, might not be doing as much respiration. So one aspect, I, there's that Dr. Chakmak out of uh, uh, Savannah University. I know, he, I think he was doing some research to show adding that boron into a pass of water, if you're looking at injection, towards the end of the day and seeing how you can increase uptake because when that plant opens up and does that transpiration at night, when those temperatures drop, can you get more boron uh, into the plant? And so there's other ways to also look into how to manage nutrition paired up with that water, uh, just looking at when and how that plant is wanting to take up that nutrition. Ryan, one of the other products that I know that you guys have in your arsenal, which we feel like is phenomenal, is a product called Relief. And really, I'm, you can jump in and, and cut me off any second here, but really get our listeners knowing that once we put some herbicides down, we really have that knockdown where we see the plants really fighting with what we sprayed and dealing with you know, all of our weeds or our insecticides that we're spraying. How does this product come into the fold? How do farmers use it? Why, why should we know about it? It's our second stage. It'd be that, okay, you did something on seed, then what? What should you keep your eyes open for? It's, you do that, that first pass over the top with that sprayer. And usually what's going on, like you hinted at, it's that herbicide pass or something's going in there, and that plant is going to have to metabolize whatever you just put in the tank. And depending on what Mother Nature's doing, usually if it's early in the season, if you're dealing with fluctuating temps, you can end up with certain mixes, depending on what they are. You can end up with that, uh, I don't know, herb- something I call it herbicide hangover. Best way I can describe relief, if you've been to the bar, had one too many beers, you might have that pounding headache. Think of relief as here's an aspirin, here's an Advil, and here's a banana. Here's, here's, some two, here's two biostimulants with nutrition. That is relief. So you've got some macro, micronutrition. You're trying to help fuel that process of helping that plant break down that chemistry, get it out of the system. And then here's two biostimulants. Here's two stress relievers that say, hey, calm down. Keep dividing. Keep elongating. Keep dividing your cells. You're okay. Yeah, that's cool. So one of the concepts along with that that we talk about a lot is a lot of these products that end inside, like, you know, any kind of pesticide, whether it's an herbicide or fungicide or whatever, we see it as a little bit of a game where you're either going forward or you're going backwards. And a lot of times after one of those products is applied, we see that hangover in the field. Certain crops, it's easier to see in onions. Onions, you spray an herbicide, which you have to do because you can lose a dramatic amount of yield if if the you, weeds outcompete the crop. You don't right? get row closure. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And so um, you've got to make that application. It's it's the most sustainable because it's the most cost efficient. So you make that application. Well, those things twist up and they look like me um, on January 1, right, after a big night. <laughs> and so, I mean, is it fair to say that really we're kind of just trying to get it back to work? I mean, we're just trying to really get this plant functioning again. Is that right? For sure, and you're trying not to. You're trying to make sure it doesn't skip a beat. You're trying to make sure that plant is having to deal with something that it wasn't really planning on doing, and it's going to have to spend energy to do it. The one compound in there, one of the biostimulants, actually tells that plant. Usually, sometimes you might see it. You get that crop stall. You hit it with that herbicide, and next thing you know, you like shoot. You drive by whatever, five, seven days later, and it still just looks like it's just sitting there. That is a lot of time being induced by that plant saying, hey, I just got smacked with something. I need to figure this out. I need to get this out of my system. I'm going to release ethylene. Ethylene ripens bananas. It makes fruit, right? It, it makes trees taper uh, at the bottom of a plant. It's when things are wounded or things like that, ethylene can get produced. One of the things that, uh, that convey molecule just tells that plant, hey, turn off the ethylene gene. You're okay. Uh, one thing you just got to be careful, if you tell that plant you're not stressed out, but you don't help fuel it, you can make that plant fall apart quicker. So that's why nutrition is really goes hand in hand with that because, again, goes back to that's why it isn't always 100% uh, 
effective. If okay, so how many studies have you guys done on a product like Relief in terms of just yield studies, right? Because if I'm a farmer, I want ROI. So if I'm going to make that pass and I'm going to throw in Relief, what? how many yield studies have you guys done on all the different crops that you work with? Oh, gosh, there's too many to count. I, I mean, I, Hundreds? I, I, thousands? <laughs> I mean, okay, so Jared started the company what, almost 15 years ago, and there's always research going on every single year, multiple times. We have multiple sites. One site's 10 acres doing replicated plot. That's happening every single year with everything else. You're doing stuff with – you've done university work. I mean, it what, – What's, a, what's a ballpark? Give us a ballpark. 1,000, 2,000, 5,000, 10,000? Sure. sure. <laughs> I mean, like, I mean, there's been over – like, just the one, the biostimulants has, has over 1,500 – university research studies done it so then it's not even just the the individual product but then you got multiple studies with just the components yeah and that's that's huge too you guys above all else have invested in that data side which we just absolutely love and we totally embrace and and we advocate for but it's not just simple studies right you guys are trying to understand what's going on so you mentioned to me we can turn off that ethylene you know, expression. I mean, ha- have you guys looked at how a product like that might upregulate certain genes or expressions in the plant or downregulate what it's doing? Research was done by a, a Dr. Belmonte out of, uh, I think, University of Guelph, if I have it right. But I mean, it, this is a study that exposing plants to a, a biostimulant under cold stress, under heat stress, um, and then in different stressful conditions, and then seeing how that plant responds on a genetic level. RNA sequencing, I mean, this study generated, it was like 43, almost 44 billion data points. And so it was looking at, I mean, I think a, a gene had to get either turned on or turned off by 150% or, or more to consider, hey, there was an effect on it. You can get lost in that research. Yeah, that's next level stuff, which is also good, right? Because we want to understand, uh, I think as we move forward, we want to understand the interactions between plants and soils and biology and plants and, you know, nutrition and genes and expression. I mean, all this stuff, it's intertwined. And and I think that's kind of where we're going with this agriculture thing is we want to have a deeper understanding of what goes on when we make applications of certain things. No, you bet. And was it happy wife, happy life, I, happy plant, happy farmer? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that's how I guess I would look at it. Is what can you do to help take stress off of that plant? I think that's one thing that this industry lacks, which you, you and ATP really bring to the market is this data, the amount of studies that you guys have done and finding these foremost people in the industry that have specialized in calcium, boron, magnesium, manganese, and the studies that you have behind it. I think that is one of the most powerful things that you have, your company has brought to light in this industry, and that kind of falls back into that technology, data, and innovation that the regenerative space has really lacked, and I think that is really where we're going to see huge leaps and bounds in agriculture, not in 24, but in the next, you know, five to 10 years in agriculture in general. Well, that will round out our RAND Pod 4. We want to thank all of our listeners for joining Regen Ag Nation and Ryan for jumping on with us today and Trey, and we will catch you next week when we drop our next episode.